All right, hello and welcome everyone to Safeguarding Yourself Against Identity Theft and Fraudulent Tax Filings presented by Liberty Tax Service. This is the first of three webinars in the hashtag Protect Your ID Advocacy campaign launched by Liberty Tax Service along with DocuSign and Legal Shield. In this webinar, you'll learn ways to better protect yourself and your business from identity theft. Our moderator for today is Jim Wheaton. Jim is a general counsel and chief compliance officer for Liberty Tax Service. He is also the 2016 chairman of the American Coalition for Taxpayer Rights. ACTR members, including Liberty Tax, are working with the IRS to identify and implement techniques to detect and prevent income tax refund fraud. So without further ado, please welcome Jim Wheaton. Go ahead and take it away, Jim. Uh, Tracy, thank you for the introduction, and I appreciate the chance to talk to all of you guys today. You know, the IRS opened for tax season yesterday. They started taking the first electronic filings and mail filings. And so this is the time of year when we're going to start to hear in the news and elsewhere about situations where people weren't able to file their tax returns when they thought they should be able to. And sometimes that's because somebody has had their identity stolen by somebody else who filed their tax return first. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that happens, how you guys can protect your information better, and, and generally about the landscape for identity theft generally to explain why it's such a big problem and, and what you need to do uh, to make sure that you're not a victim or to protect yourself if you unfortunately do become a victim. So we're going to talk today about increased awareness, some safeguards that are out there that the, most of the tax companies in the industry are using, uh, talk about some of the things that we've seen out there in terms of cases where uh, tax fraud, identity theft is actually happening and, and how, how those things are happening. And then again, as I mentioned, what, to happen, what happens if unfortunately you become a victim. You know, it's easy for all of us to think that, you know, we're not going to be the victim of identity theft. We're, we're careful with our information. We, we think that the people that we give our information to are trustworthy. But the reality is that, you know, most of us by this point have a lot of information out there, whether it's uh, in social media or in places where we've entered, uh, entered our information on a website or given it to people over the phone. And you can't always be sure that it's not going to be a problem for you and that there isn't some way that you know, somebody's going to actually get access to some of that information and piece together enough information, maybe from different places, so that you end up being more exposed than you think you are to the possibility of all kinds of identity theft, including tax refund identity theft. And we wanted to give you a couple of examples today of, of real cases in the last couple of years where these kinds of things happen. Uh, the good news is that when people get caught, the government does a really good job of punishing them, and the government's doing a better job of catching those people. The bad news is that it's happening with enough frequency that it is the kind of thing that you need to be aware of. So we've got a couple of slides here where we just want to tell you about some examples of people uh, who've been sentenced to prison in order to pay money judgments. Uh, but as you notice, for example, in this one with Demetrius Wright, you know, he's going to spend a long time in jail and he's, he's going to be told he's got to pay a lot of money back. Whether he ever does it, I guess, is a question. Uh, but he spent almost three years uh, participating in a tax fraud scheme where he used notebooks and documents where, where he had collected personal information from other people and he was able to request and probably receive most of at some point $3.6 million in fraudulent tax refunds uh, that were, were probably based on completely fictitious income, uh, but that had the effect on, of, uh, you know, hurting the ability of the people who, whose identities were stolen to be able to file for their own refunds. Uh, another example of this uh, is uh, with Florida resident Chris Edwards. Uh, he's spending five years in prison, but when they busted him, they went, went to his apartment, they found 159 debit cards that were in other people's names, three laptop computers, an encoder, credit card embosser. He's actually out there creating cards, creating fake cards, uh, because he stole people's identity. And, you know, here you, what you see is, well, he was stealing credit cards or he was stealing debit card numbers. But no, what he was really doing was going out and filing for tax refunds and unemployment benefits and using the debit card or credit card, the debit card number particularly, as the place where the tax refund was deposited. So instead of having a regular bank account, he was having the government send money to the debit cards, 
at that point, nobody ever checks your ID when you use a debit card, and so he's just out there, uh, you know, having created the debit card, having created the PIN for the debit card, spending spending money that really belonged to other people on a card that had somebody else's name actually on it, but because he had access to the card and had the refund depositor there, he didn't have any trouble getting access to the money. So tax refund involves not only, tax refund identity theft fraud involves not only people stealing your identity, but also people going out there and creating false accounts and doing other things uh, that may not only affect your identity, but eventually could affect your credit as well. And then somebody who called herself the first lady of tax fraud, our friend Rashia Wilson, she's spending 234 months in prison. Now these are generally federal crimes. Uh, they're gonna, it'll be real time. Uh, they may get some good time credit, but these are real amounts of time they may spend in prison. You know, she probably got more time because she spent so much time bragging about it. But she was told to forfeit more than $2 million and was also in, in a three and a half, four year tax ring where she engaged in tax fraud using checks and again, prepaid debit cards uh, from multiple locations, using a hotel as a base, doing all sorts of things. Uh, and and she, she was able to get, if she's fined more than $2 million, you can be sure that she committed more fraud than that. So you know, she went out there and did, did a lot of things that uh, created these kinds of problems. And you know, it, it's, it's the kind of thing we're unfortunately starting to see uh, more and more frequently every year. Look, identity theft is a problem for all of us, for Liberty Tax Service and other businesses, for organizations and government agencies, and I'll talk about a government agencies in a second, and the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, some of you guys may have seen in the news last year a couple of stories about even data breaches at the IRS level. People had enough information to go on to the IRS website, pretend to be somebody else, and pull down tax returns that people had filed in previous years and mine more more data off of those tax returns that enable them to impersonate, it will enable them potentially to impersonate those people in the future. Hopefully the IRS is going to going to be uh, protecting the people whose identities were stolen, but it doesn't just affect businesses, it just doesn't affect us personally, it affects anyone who's got the information, and sometimes that includes the government. Uh, last year, the, the industry and the state tax agencies and the IRS came together in something we call the IRS Security Summit, and I'll talk about that a little more, but all of us in the industry especially are spending much more time in 2016 thinking about ways that we can better ferret out potential identity thieves uh, and implementing systems to detect and prevent tax identity theft refund fraud. Uh, we're not going to talk about the details of what we're doing today because we're not trying to create roadmaps for the bad guys to figure out how to get around those things, but we are, we all, all of us in the industry have, have agreed to a certain level of standards uh, that we're all supposed to be implementing this year, and many of us are doing things that go well beyond those standards because we don't get any advantage when somebody steals your identity and files a tax refund. It's possible that maybe they pay for a tax, tax return when that happens, but at the end of the day, we know we're gonna have unhappy customers, and you know we're all committed to the idea that we want you guys to, to understand that when you come into a Liberty Tax store, uh, we're gonna be careful with your information and protect your identity, and so we certainly uh, have every incentive to make sure that people aren't doing this bad stuff on our watch and we're all being, we're, everyone's being more careful, but at Liberty we particularly have a, uh, a culture and a commitment to making sure that uh, we do everything possible to block identity theft. The IRS has their own strategy uh, and they're using all the technology they have to prevent, detect, and provide victim assistance uh, to people who have identity theft problems. It's, it's really a top priority not only for the IRS this year, but a top priority for many of the states uh, because the states, sometimes have not had the same technology that the, that the IRS has, and sometimes have been the weaker link in the chain, and they realize that, and a lot of the states are doing a lot more this year uh, to slow down refund processing and other things that, that may have the effect of, an, of giving them more time to catch identity theft uh, before it affects people. It doesn't affect a large percentage of tax returns, uh, but it, we do think it affects enough people that it's a, the kind of problem that uh, we all ought to, ought to be careful and worry about. Uh, when it happens, it, it has the unfortunate practical effect of making the life of the victim very difficult. There's a lot of paperwork involved, a lot of time uh, to get the government agency back on board with uh, recognizing that you're the real taxpayer. We're gonna talk about that process a little bit later uh, in this seminar, but because of all those things, 
we want to make sure that, uh, that we're careful, even, even if we think it doesn't happen uh, nearly as often as the news media might make you think sometimes. So, so what are some of the things that are out there uh, that, uh, that result in identity theft? Uh, and I think I skipped a slide here. Let me go back a second. Um, here we are. So the two most common types of fraud are first, when somebody uses your social security number for employment, and second, when they file a tax return that uses your social security number. Those are two completely different scenarios, and I'll explain each of them to you in a second. But I do want to point out one other thing that happens that, simply speaking, is not identity theft, but it does have the potential to uh, be the kind of scam that, that the same kinds of people are perpetrating against taxpayers. Uh, and that's when somebody calls you up on the telephone and says, I'm from the IRS, we noticed you have a tax deficiency or a tax problem, we need you to pay up right away. If you don't pay, right, pay up right away, we're going to put a lien on your house, we're going to seize your car, we're going to seize your bank account or freeze your bank account, we're going to do all these bad things to you. If you ever get one of those phone calls, and there's a slide about this later, but I want to make the point a couple of times today. If you get a phone call from somebody who says they're from the IRS and they need you to pay money right away, it's not the IRS. The IRS doesn't call you to demand payment. The IRS doesn't, doesn't call you and talk about your tax information on the phone. If you want to get the IRS on the phone, you actually need to call them and talk to them. If they, if they think they, there's a deficiency in, uh, from your tax return, they're going to send you a letter and tell you what you need to do with that letter. Uh, and maybe, maybe what you need to do is to call them. But they're not going to call you out of the blue and say, pay up now or you're in big trouble. If somebody is doing that, they're trying to find a way to get access to your money or to get you to pay them over the phone, and the person you are paying will not be the IRS. Uh, that is always going to be a scam. So let's talk about the two different kinds of identity theft fraud. The first one is when somebody uses your Social Security number to get employment. They don't have their own Social Security number, they can't get a job, or for whatever reason they want to hide their identity. And so they use your Social Security number uh, and fill out all their work paperwork using your name and number. They pretend to be you, uh, and, and you, you might think, well, that's great. Uh, I'm going to get more Social Security credit. My Social Security credit will be, will be, be, be uh, my Social Security check may be bigger when I'm in my 60s or 70s. But what's really happening here is they're generating income on your Social Security number and you're the one that the IRS is going to come looking to to pay the taxes because the IRS doesn't know that you've been scammed. They don't know that this is a fake person. What they know is that somebody with your Social Security number has had income. And so you're the one who, until you straighten it out with the tax agencies, is going to get the bill for the taxes, and the IRS is going to think that you have to pay, and then you're going to have to spend time unwinding all that, pro that problem. So you're going to file a tax return that doesn't include that income, and then all of a sudden you're going to find out, hey, wait a minute, uh, the IRS thinks I had more income than that. They've sent me another bill, and then how could that possibly be? I only had this other job, and the answer is somebody scammed you by using your Social Security number. The other kind of more common kind of ID theft that happens in the tax fraud area is when somebody files a false tax return in your name. All they need to do that is your name, your Social Security number and your date of birth. If you think about it, those are the only things uh, that uniquely identify you that have to show up on the tax return. The address and everything else in the tax return can be faked. And you might think, well, why doesn't the IRS just reject returns when it's from a different address than where I lived last year? And the answer is because a huge number of Americans move regularly. Uh, it, you know, it's somewhere you know north of 30 or 40 percent a year in some years, given the mobility of our population. And so the IRS can't just say, well, this is a different address than you lived at last year. You need to come back and prove that you're really you, because that would bring the tax system to a crawl. And so when you're out there and you think about what people have to have to steal your identity, it's not a lot of stuff. And they can get your name pretty easily. They can get your birthday pretty easily, particularly if uh, you're getting a lot of birthday greetings on Facebook and you're your Facebook settings aren't private. It's just not that hard to figure out when people are born. Uh, all kinds of people put their stuff up on genealogy websites, for example, and people's birthdays are out there. And so it's, it's just 
it's just not that difficult to get the information people need to file the tax return, except for getting your Social Security number. And so protecting your Social Security number is, is really going to be the key. And they don't have to use the bank account that you used. They're going to create their own bank account, maybe a temporary bank account. Uh, it may be that they have the tax preparer. They tell the tax preparer they'd rather get a uh, paper check, and the preparer arranges for the IRS to pay, pay the refund in a way that uh, generates a check uh, that is sent to the fake address, or maybe it's deposited immediately or within several days after the return is filed uh, to a debit card. And the debit card is not necessarily going to be traceable. It may be a prepaid debit card, as we've talked about already with a couple of the scams that you already saw. And so it's very easy for somebody to come in and, you know, file that tax return, uh, disappear into the wilderness. Uh, they've got their debit card. They know it's going to get funded. Once it gets funded, they spend the money, they transfer it somewhere else, and there's no way to find that person again. So it's possible for a thief not only to do that to one person, but to do this to, you know, dozens of people every day or week or month. You know, their entire mills, like this one we saw where they're operating out of a hotel room a few minutes ago, where people are just engaging in a business of filing tax returns uh, that are fake. And so, you know, be aware that, you know, if you haven't protected your Social Security number and your other information, uh, you know, this is something you're going to see pretty regularly. You know, what's Congress doing about it? What's the government doing about it? Uh, is, I'll talk about the IRS in a second. Uh, there is a very serious bill in front of Congress this year uh, that, that we do think is likely to get some traction. As you'll see on the slide, it's been introduced by Senators Hatch and Wyden. They're from both sides of the aisle. Uh, they have spent a lot of time thinking about these kinds of issues, and they are the chair and the ranking minority member of the Senate Finance Committee, which is the major U.S. Senate committee that deals with these kinds of issues. And uh, we, we think they're probably going to start moving this bill forward within the next month or so. It's going to impose some new obligations on the IRS and, and the industry to protect people's identities, which is fine. Uh, so we do think there's going to be progress, but progress in implementing all those things is going to take some time. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the solutions that we find this year in the law or otherwise are going to be enough to keep ahead of the, the bad guys because the government can get better at this, but the bad guys also get better at committing fraud. So we do expect it to be a continuing problem. And, and our role as a, as a major company in the tax industry is to participate with the IRS and others in doing our best to shut down as many avenues of fraud as we can. And that's certainly something we're working hard on. The IRS has done a lot on this in the last several years. Uh, they've stopped 19 million suspicious returns from 2011 to 2014. They've initiated over 1,000 identity theft-related investigations, uh, working with the Department of Justice. Uh, more, you know, more than 700 people have been sentenced to prison for uh, identity theft tax fraud. Uh, people are actually going to jail now. They're not, get, they're not walking away. And we showed you that in the examples that we uh, provided on the other slide. I mean, th this is a real criminal thing uh, that is being taken very seriously. Uh, the IRS has a release form that you can provide to get a special PIN, a personal identification number, that you're going to be able to use if you've been a victim of identity theft to prove that you are who you say you are. We'll talk about that process later in the program. Uh, they've got additional pilot programs that they've launched in a couple of places in the country uh, where everyone is entitled to ask for and get a PIN. They haven't really rolled that part of the program out to everybody because, frankly, you know, creating another couple hundred million numbers that uh, Americans have to use is a complicated process uh, and, and an administrative complication for the government agencies would have to work with those numbers. It's also one more number we'd all have to remember. And so it's not something that they've necessarily made available everywhere in the country now, but it is available in some parts of the country uh, where some of you guys may be, and it's also something uh, that is available to you if you are an actual victim of fraud. Uh, what has the tax industry done? Uh, first, you know, if you think about it, if you actually go in and have your return prepared in a brick and mortar physical tax preparation office, you know, you're generally going to expect that at some point during your interview, you're going to be asked to produce real identity, uh, your driver's license or something else to prove that you are who you say you are. And for some kinds of credits that you apply for, 
you may have to uh, demonstrate that you're actually a parent or the guardian or the care caregiver uh, for you know for somebody else who may be in your household. So it's it, it's an easier process to identify uh, to protect people's identities when when you're coming to a tax preparation office. Uh, it's a little more complicated when you're online because you don't know who's on the other end of the computer terminal. But online, most tax preparation companies are doing a much better job in 2016 by adding new screening procedures procedures that'll better confirm you know that a customer really is who they say they are. So. What happened is that the IRS recognized this problem last year, and the commissioner of the IRS actually convened a summit meeting uh, late during the tax season last year in April, at which all the major tax companies, a lot of the states, and the IRS were represented. And we set up working groups that, that met throughout 20, 2015 to talk about the different things we were going to do to improve the way we all prevent identity theft uh, going forward. So. If you're an online tax customer this year, you will probably not be surprised or shouldn't be surprised to see that you're going to be asked more questions about who you are, if, particularly if you're not a returning customer, uh, you know, logging in with a recognized uh, password and email address from a previous year. You may get asked by some companies what are called out-of-the-box questions, the kind of questions that some of you may exp have experienced if you've ever lost your password uh, on for your online you know, banking services or anything else. Uh, so, you know, you know, how big is your mortgage payment? What year did you take out your mortgage? Those kinds of questions. Or you may have been asked, be, been asked to create in the past or be asked to create now additional, you know, questions that are not necessarily the kind that would be on the internet. You know, your, your wife's, mate, your, your wife's uh, mother's maiden name or grandmother's maiden name or grandmother's first name. You know, those kinds of things that might be more difficult for people to steal or to get access to on the internet. Those kind, that kind of authentication is out there, and there's also going to be more cooperation between the industry and the IRS and the states in sharing patterns of fraud or potential fraud that we see out there. It's not the kind of thing where we're going to be sending off individual returns on a, on a one-off basis uh, to the government and saying, hey, take a look at this one. It's more a question of identifying bigger patterns that you ought to be aware of and see so that you can, uh, that they ought to be aware of uh, so they can figure out how do the bad guys do things. For example, you know, looking at, you know, whether people are using strange web addresses, what are called IP addresses, to file their tax returns. Uh, if you live in Kansas and your tax return this year is being filed from a computer in Nigeria, that's a pretty good indicator that maybe the person doing the tax return this year is not you. And so, you know, stopping those, which, which we do, certainly the tax companies do at our end, is important, but also, you know, making uh, the government aware of, you know, where the fraud rings may be by identifying where we're seeing clusters of strange, strange addresses or clumps of addresses that people are using to file a whole lot of tax returns is one way, or attempt to file them, is one way for us to cooperate with the government in helping them, you know, figure out which data points are most likely to to help them prevent identity theft and other tax fraud. And so we're cooperating, uh, you know, with the IRS to do that. The good news is that, I, you know, at least at the credit card level, uh, we've all gotten so much more careful in industry, not only the tax industry, but the retail industry has gotten so much more careful, careful with handling uh, personal data that we're seeing identity theft victim numbers and their amounts of losses go down. But again, it's a constant battle to stay ahead of the bad guys, and it's, it's the kind of thing that, that we need to be vigilant about and that you need to be vigilant about as well. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how you might have information out on the Internet that enables people to commit some tax fraud, but we want to, we want to give you some other tips about other things you can do to protect yourself even better. Uh, look, thieves can get information from all kinds of places, hospitals, doctor's offices, your car dealership, I know my daughter got a phone call, bought a car a couple of weeks ago, got a phone call. They said, hey, can you email us a copy of your Social Security card? Not real thrilled with that request as, as the dad. Uh, I understand why they needed it, and, you know, I understand that they forgot to ask, tell her to bring it to the dealership when she bought the car. Uh, but, but, again, it's not the kind of thing I really want her sending out over the Internet, uh, you know, as an attachment to an email. Uh, but, you know, those kinds of things happen. Uh, you know, your burglar alarm company, apartment complex managers have a lot of data about you. 
but government agencies can also be the source of some of these data breaches. One of the big tax fraud rings in the last couple of years happened in Alabama, and several people have been prosecuted and sent to jail for it. But the source of a lot of that data was actually an Alabama state employee who had access to a database uh, of a lot of Alabama citizens and provided a lot of that key information to a tax fraud ring. And so even government agencies can be careless with information, and it, you, you need to be aware that you know it's, it's going to be on you at some level to be really careful about asking questions and saying, why do you need that information? Why do you need my whole Social Security number? What are you going to use that for, and how do you protect it? Uh, I think you all know that using free Wi-Fi in some places uh, can, can be risky. Uh, and Remember, as we talked about before, the thieves are not going to use a payment method that allows the government to come find them. They're not going to put it into their own personal permanent bank account. Uh, they're going to put it into some place where the money disappears really quickly. And so uh, it, it, it's, it's important that we try to catch the fraud at the source. You know, be careful about what you put in your trash. Uh, these do go through trash cans. Uh, they use what are called skimming devices. If you're not familiar with what a skimming device is, but it, you know, and, and this was an issue in the Target data breach a couple of years ago, if you remember when Target stores had all their problem. Uh, people put a device on a cash register or an ATM machine that uh, is relatively invisible unless you're paying a lot of attention, but it's actually, you know, recording the, the numbers and, and the pins and other things uh, that people enter when they're, you know, engaging in a transaction. And so those kinds of skimmers, which they then go and, you know, at, you know, three in the morning, whatever they go by the ATM, they take the skimmer off, they take the data out of there. You know, you know, their ability to collect that information uh, improves as, as technology improves because the technology for doing bad things also gets better. And so they use those kinds of devices. So if you're using an ATM machine or someplace else where you're seeing something unusual, you know, say something or think twice about whether you need to go to another branch of the uh, the bank or you know, you know, go in and write a check for cash the next day or do what you need to do if you're worried about the possibility that your data might be compromised. These also steal stuff out of your mail, your bank statements, your bills, your credit card offers, and sometimes they can be fellow employees who steal personnel records or, or other information from their company sometimes when they're on their way out the door. And so, again, lots of places, lots of places for them to get their data. What can you do? Uh, don't carry your Social Security card around your wallet. There are very few cases where you ever need that anymore. Uh, you ought to keep it someplace secure at home or in a safe deposit box, but you don't need to have it in your wallet. Don't give your number to anyone. Don't put it in your phone in, in a way that's not encrypted so that somebody, if you lose your phone, somebody's got your Social Security number there because you, you put it in your phone for them. Uh, you know, if, if you can, you ought to find a way to shred your personal information. If you don't have a shredder or don't want to go out and get one, you can, you can you know, periodically take your key stuff over to one of the office supply stores and they've got shredding services. There are lots of places that can do that for you, uh, but, but don't leave it laying around and don't just throw it in the trash can unshredded uh, because that's just risky. Your medical records are also one of those categories of records that you want to do a, a good job protecting. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about your credit report in a, in a couple of minutes but you want to check your credit report several times a year. You can do that for three, free every year with each of the three agencies, but as a practical matter, what that means is you can do it once every four months because you can do one agency in April, you can do another agency in August, you can do another agency in December, and then cycle it all over again the next year. So you're really able to check it every four months without having to pay anything. You want to make sure your personal computer is protected with the appropriate firewall and anti-spam and virus software. And, you know, when you get prompted to do one of those software updates and it's an, an annoying time, do it anyway, or make sure you do it later that day. Don't put it off for months and months because you don't want to reboot your computer. You, you know you need to do it. It's a safety thing. Just do it. And then the obvious, you know, be careful about giving your personal information over the mail, uh, or it, through the mail or over the phone or over the Internet, unless you've initiated the contact or you're sure you know the person. I was on the phone with one of the cell phone companies that called me uh, uh, a couple of months ago, and they're, you know, they, they get me on the phone, and immediately they start to do verification of me. You know, can you tell us your address and all this stuff? I'm like, hold on a minute. What about you? How do I know you're really from phone company X? You know, I don't know who you are. I didn't initiate this phone call. How do I know you are who you really are? 
and you know they went blah 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 for a minute, and you know the answer is you, you got to be careful. You know why would you give all these identity verification answers to somebody who called you when you're not entirely sure who they are, particularly since sometimes when those customer service companies numbers call you, they call from a blocked number because they don't want you to call them back. And so, you know, you might want to say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll, I'd rather do this by mail or I'd rather call your well-known customer service number that, that is in my phone bill and you tell me what extension to ask for. But don't just willy-nilly give your information out to somebody who calls you over the phone. There's just never any good reason to do that. If, if you're in a place uh, where you think you have a burglar alarm system, unfortunately, that's probably everywhere in the United States now. I don't know that there's any neighborhood where you can assume that your information is safe because you can leave your door unlocked all day. I wish America was still like that, but it's not. Uh, but if you're going to get a burglar alarm system, it works better before the break-in than after the break-in. That's sort of that's sort of an obvious thing, but, uh, but it's one of those things, if you think you ought to do it, don't keep putting it off until later. Don't put your valuables and important papers in a place where somebody who walks in can find them right away. Uh, have, have a special place for them. Protect your uh, financial information. Uh, you know, if, if you think you ought to have a bank safe deposit box, do that, it's particularly if you don't have any sort of home alarm system. And when you hire a tax preparation service or somebody else to do your taxes, don't use somebody simply because they are the lowest lowest bidder. You know, if somebody's out there, set, you know, with a trailer on the side of the road and says, I can do your taxes for $50, you've got to ask yourself, how safe is the copy of my W-2 that I'm going to give them in their trailer, you know, or in their temporary office where they're going to, you know, you know they're not going to be there next year. Uh, they may do an okay job preparing your taxes. They may be the cheapest person out there. But you've also got to worry about whether they're going to protect your information because once you give it to them, they potentially have it forever, and there's there's really nothing you can do about that. Sorry. Uh, so how do you know if you might be a victim? What are what are some of the signs? Uh, if you stop getting bills and other things you used to get by mail. Now sometimes that happens because you go on somebody's website. And a lot of them are trying to auto default you into no longer taking mail bills. But if you didn't make that choice, you need to check that because if you stop getting bills, and maybe because somebody went on there and stole your identity, they didn't want you to find out that they were putting credit card charges on your credit card or doing other things with your identity. And so they stopped your mail bills, and it might take you a couple of months to realize you're not getting bills anymore, or at least until they call you for not making your payment. Uh, if you start receiving credit cards you didn't apply for, that may be a sign. If you get denied credit uh, and you, you don't understand why because you've always had good credit, that may be something that tells you that you ought to be looking. Uh, if your bank account has, un has unusual charges on it uh, that you don't remember making, uh, that may be, a, may be a sign. And then finally, obviously, if you lose your wallet or your handbag or, or, ha or you know you've had it stolen, you really ought to be jumping really quickly on making sure that you know, thinking about what information you have that identifies you in that wallet and, uh, you know, and, and making sure you take appropriate action to deal with the, the possibility that you're now going to be a victim of identity theft. What do you do if you think you are a victim? You should file a report with your police department. That's sort of obvious. But there are other resources available to you. Most of the state attorneys general uh, have, uh, have identity theft programs. Uh, so in your state, you want to figure out where that is. There is a National Identity Theft Resource Center, and the information is here on the slide, uh, that you can contact. They're out in California, but they, they're bona fide, and, they, and a lot of different reputable companies are supporters of this nonprofit enterprise. And this is a place if you, where if you think you have an identity theft uh, problem, they can walk you through all the steps. Um, obviously, if you believe you're a victim of tax refund identity theft, there are probably additional things you're going to have to do. There is an IRS form you need to file when your identity has been stolen. Uh, it's an affidavit. It's Form 14039, and you're going to have to actually mail that in with copies of government-issued identification, a passport, a driver's license, your Social Security card. Yes, I am telling you, you're going to have to put that in the mail, and you're going to have to send it to the IRS with a paper copy of your real tax return. So here's what happens when somebody steals your identity uh, at, through, through tax return fraud. What typically happens is that you find out because you go file your own return and the IRS says or tells your preparer, no, that return can't be filed. They've already filed this year. 
and you're sitting there saying, no, I haven't filed this year. I didn't do that at all. I, have, you know, I just came to you today. And the, the, what, ha, what has happened here is that somebody with your Social Security number already filed, and that triggers the IRS system to reject any additional filings with the same Social Security number. So you find that out, you're then going to have to go through and file this identity theft affidavit. There's also a toll-free number, and it is one of the numbers that they are more likely to actually have a, a live person to help you on uh, for, for their identity protection unit, and that number is here, and they're open uh, during the week, uh, 12 hours a day, so you do have somebody you can, uh, you can call there. Uh, if you get scam emails, what are called phishing emails, you ought to be forwarding website links and, and emails like that to the IRS so that they can be aware of, of these kinds of scams, particularly if they deal uh, with tax fraud, potential tax fraud. Uh, and we call that phishing. Phishing is when, uh, phishing with a PH, phishing is when somebody sends you an email or some other communication that looks like it's real or sends you to a website that looks like it's real. And, you, and a lot of times you can't tell that it's not real. They're using the company's logo. They're using email addresses that sort of look real, although maybe they're a little crazy. Um, and, you know, you look at that and say, well, wait a minute, that email address doesn't look right. It doesn't have libertytax.com in it or libertytax.net in it. It has libertytax.fraudster.net uh, or something weird that where, where the company you think you're dealing with isn't the main part of the domain name or the main part of the email address. And when you see those kinds of emails that are unusual, that are not consistent with what you got before, uh, don't click on the stuff. Don't open the attachment. Don't go to the link. Uh, that's how they actually get access to your computer, potentially infect it with a virus, do other things, uh, try to steal information from you. Uh, you're, you're probably clicking on some sort of program that's going to do something bad to your computer. So when you see something like that that looks suspicious, pick up the phone and call the company that you're dealing with at a number you know is real rather than uh, just clicking on a bad link uh, because that's how bad people uh, get there. It used to be you could identify all those bad links by saying, you know what, that email is barely in English and there's no way my bank would send me an email with that many spelling errors and grammar errors. The answer is that the fraudsters have gotten better at that and they have better English language tutors or whatever's going on, but, uh, but generally speaking, they are better at that. If the IRS sends you an email, you ought to be contacting them. But they're not going to send you an email, but if they send you a letter and you're not sure that it's real, call them and confirm that it is real. And if you do get a scam involving the IRS, let them know so they can prevent uh, other people from uh, falling for the same scam. Uh, as I told you before, the IRS is never going to call or email you and ask you for a Social Security number and ask you other questions about your tax return or to demand payment. They just don't operate that way. You can also file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission if you think you're a victim of tax refund fraud uh, or any other kind of identity theft fraud. You, you can also contact the federal government through the Justice Department. And if you're, you know that your Social Security number has been misused, it would be appropriate to contact the Social Security Administration and let them know about that as well. Uh, finally, uh, you need to do what you've got to do to protect your credit. As I said, you're entitled to one free credit report from each of the three agencies every year. Uh, those agencies are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Uh, but if you go to this website, annualcreditreport.com, not freecreditreport.com, that's an actual, that's a different service. Annualcreditreport.com is the place where the three credit reporting agencies have said, hey, click on one of our links and their bona fide website and you can get your free credit report. And you can do that with each of them once a year, which means you can space it out and do one every four months. And what you're able to do after you've entered all the information you need to enter to verify that you're really you is you'll get a report that shows your credit status, your payment status on your credit cards or your mortgage or your any any credit stuff your your uh, landlord has reported. All that kind of stuff is going to show up in your report. And you need to look at the report carefully and say, hey, you know, there's a credit card I don't recognize there. Or everything's copacetic. Everything, everything is there that I expect to be there. And then you, then you feel a little bit of relief. But what I recommend is you actually take whatever calendar app you use and put reminders in there every four months to go check your credit report and then just cycle through each of them. Uh, it, it takes a few minutes every four months. But again, it's one way you can be aware and be careful of what's really happening out there on your credit and protect yourselves. Uh, so again, you know, it's, it's really about being careful on your part. And 
and, and, and safeguarding your own information. If you become a victim, particularly if, it's, if you're a victim of something revolving, involving tax identity theft, even if you haven't been a Liberty Tax customer before, we welcome you to go to any of our offices and tell them you need to file an identity theft tax affidavit and they'll help you through it. They'll, they'll consult with you for free about how to, how to solve the problem and uh, we're always glad to be of service that way. You know, keep in mind, we're, we're pretty much everywhere you are. We're the fastest growing tax preparation company in the world. We have over 4,300 locations in the U.S. and Canada. So we're certainly somewhere near your neighborhood. And if you've got one of these kinds of problems, particularly if it involves your taxes, uh, we're there to help. So I appreciate you guys participating and attending today. And again, uh, there are a couple more seminars in this series that are coming up uh, with our partners on this initiative. And, and we're just out there trying to help you guys become more aware and better consumers and do, and do the best job you can in helping us to protect you. So thank you and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.